Hello everyone, Chaos here, and welcome to another old-school RuneScape video. Last year, we started strong with 150 tips and tricks for the game, and today, I bring you 151 more for you to put to use in your adventures. No matter where your account is in terms of progress, I'm certain you'll learn something new. Just like the previous one, as you can see, this video will be fairly long, so the only thing I will do before we get in with the tips is to tell you to subscribe to the channel and to give it a like. For every new subscription, my puppy will get a kiss. So, let's begin. The first five involve your account and how secure it is. Whether it be new or old, make sure to use a unique email with a unique password as well as two-factor authenticator, and do the same for your RuneScape account to lock your stuff down. Make sure to save important information regarding your account if it ever gets compromised. Save information like date of creation, internet service providers, previous passwords, and save receipts if you buy membership or bonds. More recently, Jagex created their own game launcher from where you can play old school RuneScape and RuneScape 3 alike. They offer great tools, but most importantly, it has better password structure for stronger security. The reason I say this is because at the time of making this video, and honestly for the foreseeable future, old school RuneScape passwords are not case sensitive. So make sure to have a good password with lowercase letters and numbers. Now I'm sure you've heard horror stories about people falling for fake emails. On your screen you will see a list of official Jagex addresses you will get emails from, and they will generally call you by your username, but it doesn't hurt to double check. Our next 5 tips are about common scams from more to less believable. If you go on Twitch and see a popular streamer announcing they are quitting, it is a phishing scam which will take you to a fake OSRS website for your login information. Extremely similar to the previous one, if you see people in the game saying that they are quitting and you need to watch a video to enter a giveaway, said video will also contain a phishing link to steal your details. Don't even bother reporting them, they're cockroaches and they're gonna pop out every second. When you go to the Grand Exchange, you will see people wearing this outfit. 99% of the time these are gambling bots which will advertise great payouts, but in the end they will almost always come out on top. Just report them and move on. You can also see people buying items for more than what they are actually worth, so when you show the item they will ask if you want coins or tokens. They will tell you to meet their main in Camelot and offer a teleport, hoping you accept with your item still on the trade screen. The final scam people commonly fall for are intricate lures which socially engineer it to gain your trust, like asking you to wear something for a video. The end goal is to take you to a PvP world and kill you if you have valuable items on you, so don't even listen to them. Up next we have resources for you to learn even more about this wonderful game. Up first we have the official OSRS wiki. The website has every imaginable detail about old school RuneScape from where to find items, to quest requirements, to money makers, and much more. You can find all of these links in the description, and the next one is a damage spreadsheet calculator you can download from Google Drive. Input however many combinations of items for what monster you're fighting for your best loadout. This is a great time to plug our own Discord so you can interact with me and our amazing community. Come join us to chat and also have the occasional 99 parties, boss mass events, and of course the general guidance for the game. The main OSRS Discord is also a great place to visit, as you will get all official information from Jagex. The best part about it is when something goes wrong in old school RuneScape, you can see almost everyone flaming and memeing in all the channels. For the last one, well, you're on it right now! It doesn't matter if you want to learn where to find an item spawn or more intricate guides for things like raids, if you have a question you can probably find what you need on YouTube, and this channel has a ton of great guides. Up next we have 5 friends chat which will help you out with specific activities. OSRS SOA will help you find partners for Shield of Arav and even the Heroes quest since it requires 2 people to complete. It will take you a while, but you will almost always find them. You can go to the Star Miners friend chat in order to locate shooting stars and even call them out yourself. This activity is pretty cool to do with other people, and it's a great way to trade mining, although won't provide huge experience per hour. Have you ever wondered which worlds people have splashing arty knights on them to stand still as you fiddle their pockets? Thieving Host has you covered. Ask for a current world to go join them and the terrain thieving with just a few spam clicks. The chat deliver items will have people willing to bring you supplies at the different spots of the map, granted you pay them for your servers with money or drops. A great place to use it would be Dagonot King, since the walk there is abysmal. And finally, you can go to Casual BA in order to find the teams for Barbarian Assault, but keep in mind that doing this with randoms is still pretty painful, so why not join our Discord and run this activity with our team of legends for a faster torso. Alright, plugs aside, now we have 10 tips for your interface. If you right-click on your spellbook, you can activate a filter for you to see a new button. You can then show or hide combat or utility spells, teleports, and even filter by spells you have the runes for. I mentioned this one in 2022, but a small reminder that the minigame teleports were moved to the clan tab and then the grouping section. 
Fun fact, there are some activities listed here, but you can't even teleport there, such as the Dagonoth Kings. If you want to vote on the latest poll, you don't have to go to a bank, even though I like doing so. All you need to do is open the Account Management tab, then the Community section, and click on the Poll button to have your say in the future updates remotely. If you go to the list of worlds, you can right-click them in order to add the two of them to your favorites. If you want to change them, right-click a favorite world and then clear it to make room for the new one, so choose wisely. Go ahead and click on the Accept Aid button to be able to receive aid from players, like being invited to a clan, potion sharing, being teleported with a group teleport, and much more. You can turn it off if you don't want to be bothered by such things. When you go to a 99 party, or if you want to spice up your chat a little more, you can use commands before your messages to make them a different color, an alternate color, and even make the text move or shake. You can see some of the commands on screen right now. Another repeat from the previous video, but way too good not to mention again. Go ahead and check the skull prevention on the settings page. This way, you're not gonna be skull tricked in the wilderness for smelly rats to trick you for your items. While you're on your settings menu, go to the control section to set up your F keys. This way, you can switch between your inventory, prayer, and spellbook, just to name a few, all with the use of your F keys to avoid unnecessary clicks and the play better. With the addition of combat achievements, you can turn off some spam notifications telling you that you failed a specific challenge. On the other hand, you can make it so you are told if you beat an achievement again, even if you already have it. For the final one in this category, go to the gameplay section of the settings for you to turn on or off some of the camera effects during gameplay. This includes removing the camera shaking at barrows, fishing trawler, and much more to avoid having a seizure. We now move on to 10 more powerful Runelight plugins you must use in 2023. And the first tip is, well, what is Runelight? It's an official third-party client to play with tons of extra tools, but make sure to download it from the official website or runelight.net. Next, we have a two-for-one. Get both the bank tags and the bank tag layout to be able to set your bank like never before. The process is pretty simple, but way too long to mention here, so go watch my video to learn how to do it efficiently. Another repeat from the previous video is inventory tags. And it's because people still ask about it during my streams. With it, you can add any color outline to your objects by shift-right-clicking on them and picking whatever color you want for them. Same thing with the menu entry swapper. By shift-right-clicking on items like in your inventory, your gear, and even shop items to name a few, you can change the left and the shift-click option to then maximize efficiency and can be used at a ton of places. With NPC indicators, you can tag items around RuneScape to show what tiles they occupy on the map. You can do this with shift right click on the monster or manually adding their names to the list in the plugin settings. Similar to that, with a tile indicator plugin and by checking an option that says highlight true tile, you will see where your character truly is at all times to get better movement mechanics. This is crucial for many activities in the game later down the road. Next we have player indicators. And I personally use this when I go to the wilderness to show players when I'm doing things like hunting for ecumenical keys. You can also highlight friends and clan members to spot them automatically. A great plugin for the fight caves is called FC Spawn Predictor. It will tell you where all the monsters in the fight caves are going to spawn based on a set rotation. And it's actually great to improve your times, and even if you're getting started. You simply cannot do the Tombs of a Mascot without the... Tombs of a Mascot plugin. I mean, you can, but it just gives you so much utility, it would be silly not to have it. It will help you in pretty much every puzzle room, especially the Kefri memory puzzle. The final plugin for now is called Wikisync. If you have it, you can then go to the OSRS wiki, visit any quest or achievement diary page, and it will automatically tell you if you meet the requirements for a quest or an achievement diary. Now we start the combat section with a good one, and it is that after 10 minutes on a specific area where there's aggressive monsters, they will lose interest on you. The Runelite plugin NPC Aggression Timer will help with this information. As you all know, there are many level boosts in RuneScape, both visible and invisible. Visible boosts will allow you to do things such as cast spells you don't have the level for, but this doesn't work on weapons, so don't try to cheat the system. When you're fighting monsters in single combat areas, for example by having a cannon, if you start attacking a monster that's far away, you can be interrupted by one that's closer to you, which can be a little annoying. This one is a little more advanced, but when fighting enemies, especially from a distance, they will always try to align with you based on their southwestern tile. They will prioritize horizontal movement and then vertical so you can safe spot them. In May of 2022, weapons in Old School RuneScape had their level requirements changed based on weapon rebalance proposed a long time ago. If you haven't played the game in a while, go and check your weapons and if you can still wear them. When you're training ranged, make sure to stick to a short bow for your early levels. Longbows have slightly more accuracy but will be a lot slower, which is not that great. 
Use short bows until you switch to a crossbow, a blowpipe, a bofa, or a tebow. When it comes to armor, armadillo may sound like a good option, as it's second best in slot. But it's actually a noob trap. You're much better off with God the Hide for you to work your way towards Missouri, which is the best ranging armor in the game. When you talk to the range tutor in Lumbridge, you can ask them to have your arrows automatically go to your quiver when you pick them up, in case you use an Avas accumulator and it fails to retrieve them for you. So, activate it as soon as possible. When using a blowpipe, you can't even put poison darts on it, regardless of the tier or the price. This is because you will already have a chance to venom your target, so putting poison darts in there is pretty redundant. And speaking of the blowpipe, when you use it in combination with a serpentine helm, you have a 100% chance to venom your target, granted it hits. This is pretty useful at some places for consistent damage, and the venom is a lot more powerful. Go back to the combat tutors in Lumbridge, but this time talk to the magician. You will be able to toggle an ability to automatically put runes in your rune pouch whenever you pick them up, so you can save on inventory. Speaking of the rune pouch, with the release of the Tombs of a Mascot, an untradeable drop from the raid made it so you can upgrade your rune pouch into a Divine Rune Pouch. It holds 4 types of runes instead of 3, and you need 75 crafting to make it. With one of the most recent additions being Secrets of the North, you can fight the Phantom Mospa boss which drops Ancient Essence. By combining 150,000 of these to an imbued heart, it will turn into a saturated heart which works like a divine potion. If you are in the Lunar Spellbook and train magic with a spell called the Plank Make, you can click on the spell once to do it automatically. Or you can manually click on them to do it a lot faster. Just keep in mind this is fairly click intensive. And finally for magic, remember that different staves can autocast spells on different spellbooks. For example, the Slayer Staff can autocast Crumble Undead, the Nightmare Staff can autocast Ancients, and the Kodai Wand can't cast Archaeal spells. Up next we have a Prayer. Just like Plank Make, if you take your bones to either a Gilded Altar or a Chaos Altar, you can manually click on the bones to use them there to go through your inventory a lot faster for more experience. With the Archaeus Spellbook rework, we had spells added called Demonic Offering and Sinister Offering. Respectively, you can offer up to 3 Ashes and Bones for prayer experience, if you don't want to use Altars, or if you don't have access to them. By completing the quest Spirits of the Elid, you will be able to pray at the Elidna statue at Narda. It's like an ornate pool in your POH, and it's recommended to have the Elite Desert Diary for unlimited teleports there. And it also overheals your HP. Speaking of overheals, there's an item called the Ancient Mace. By doing its special attack, you will be able to overheal your prayer based on how much you hit. It's great to do activities like the Inferno where every prayer point counts. And finally, there's a technique called the Prayer Flicking, which has you turning prayers on and off at specific intervals to save on prayer or not use any at all. I'll go more into detail about this on another video, so check it out after this one. Let's now talk about combat achievement updates. By completing at least the easy tier, you will get extra warrior tokens at the Warriors Guild and extra points per pest control game at any boat. Not really worth it in my opinion, but the more you know. If you finish the medium tier, you will start having increased the cannonball capacity for your dwarf multi-cannon. The smallest upgrade starts at 35, and it's going to scale all the way up to 60 with the completion of the Elite Diary. Also for the medium tier, as long as you wear your Gomez Hilt in the Barrows Brothers tombs, your prayer will never drain. This is especially useful for lower levels, where you typically want to stay there for longer. When you complete the hard tier, you will need 50% less points to imbue items at the Nightmare Zone and at Soul Wars. This is especially useful if you die with items that need an imbue, or if you want to refund your points to sell your items back to the GE. Last one for now, if you complete the Elite tier, your Bracelets of Slaughter and Expeditious will have a small chance of fully regenerating when you use their final charge. It's not much, but whenever it activates, it's going to be a nice hit of dopamine. Now, let's move on to Slayer. We all know the Black Mask is a key item for this skill. By imbuing it at the Nightmare Zone or Soul Wars, you will get extra bonuses for both ranged and magic. Otherwise, it only works for melee. Something I recently learned is that you cannot have a Wilderness Task if you already have a task from the other Slayer Masters. This works the other way around, and you must finish the Wildy Slayer task before going for another. When finishing tasks, you will get more points according to your streak task for numbers 10, 50, 100, 250, and finally 1000. If you want to amass a big amount of points, you can use a technique called Ethereal Skipping, which we've mentioned before. If you are looking for a specific task, because of how Slayer masters and their assignments work mathematically, you can go to a specific one for better chances at what you are looking for. For example, the best chance at a Fire Cape task would be with Neve and Steve. And finally, when the lower Slayer Masters assign a specific monster, remember there are a lot of variants to different monsters for you to have many options. For example, if you're assigned zombies, you can kill undead chickens and cows north of Port Phasmatis. And now time for the best skill in the game. 
For rune crafting, we have a new pouch, which is called the Colossal Pouch. You get them with a drop from Guardians of the Rift called the Abyssal Needle, and use it with all four previous pouches. It holds a whopping 40 essence. Remember how the pouches were only obtainable from the Abyss? Well, now you can get them at Guardians of the Rift. Every time you loot the Rewards Guardian, you have a 1 in 9.3 chance of obtaining them, and you will always get one if you don't have one already. On the same note, remember how the Dark Mage in the Abyss or NPC Contact was the only way to fix your pouches? Well, with the Abyssal Pearl from Guardians of the Rift, you can also repair them, and again, it is a safe way to do so to avoid death in the Abyss. From this minigame, you can get an item called the Abyssal Lantern. By adding different logs to it, you can have a different effect that will aid you in the minigame. For earning extra points, to your pouches never degrading inside the game. When you keep looting the Rewards Guardian, if you get duplicate unique items such as Abyssal Dyes or Lanterns, you can sell them to the NPC next to your bank for more Abyssal Pearls and take you closer to your current goal. Another item you are looking for at Guardians of the Rift are Intricate Pouches, which are basically extra loot. From them, you can get a blue amulet, and by giving it to the Lumberge Guide, he will give you an amulet for unlimited teleports to the minigame. With Abyssal Pearls, you can buy the runecrafting outfit called Rainments of the Eye. Each piece provides a 10% chance of crafting more runes, and with the full outfit, the bonus jumps to 60%. This way, you can do the achievement diaries at earlier levels. The final Guardians of the Rift tip is that in order to unlock the full activity, you will need the quests Lost City for Cosmic Runes, Throw Stronghold for Law Runes, Morning Sand Part 2 for Death Runes, and Sins of the Father for Blood Runes. And speaking of blood, a new item by the name Blood Essence will give you more Blood Runes when crafting them with whatever method you choose. They are a must-have item in your inventory if crafting them at the True Blood Altar or at Zaya. Finally for rune crafting, if you keep using your pouches, the biggest one will degrade and will hold less essence. Apparently, if you fix the large one, if you keep using it, it has a chance to vanish, so fix them as soon as possible. For construction, you can move your rooms around with a construction interface. You may switch their places, rotation, and that's a great way to organize your house instead of destroying rooms and rebuilding them. On screen you are seeing the quote-unquote useless rooms for any POH. These serve no purpose other than having fun with your friends, but let's be honest, you probably don't have any and you're the only person who visits your POH. As powerful as a menu entry swapper plugin is, it doesn't work for construction training because it would be way too broken. Sadly, you still have to stick to destroying your wrists by clicking remove and build like we've been doing for years. There's an odd farming training method that involves bag the plants and supposedly gives a lot of farming experience. To my knowledge, this is only good for the early levels, so you won't have to do this weird method for long, or not at all. If you don't want to get 99 construction, 84 is all you need to boost to level 92 for the highest portal nexus with a plus 5 spices to boost and a crystal saw. For the Spirit Tree and Fairy Ring combination, you need 90, since the Crystal Saw is not going to work for that one. When it comes to agility and the max level for content that's not a 99, level 93 is all you need. This grants access to the shortcut that takes you from the cave system under Canifis to the True Blood Altar. It's a bit steep, but hey, it's not 99. Agility levels will dictate how fast your run energy regenerates. This is actually exponential, and you can get a pretty good boost at level 60 or even 50, and any level after that will give you more run energy, but not as much as the lower levels. Stamina potions are a staple item to keep running around, but there are more items that will give you run energy if you can't get them. On screen you are seeing some of these items, and one of the best ones is a strange fruit you can steal from fruit stalls. The Ring of Endurance can be charged with stamina potions, and the buff will only work when drinking said potions. If you use the Agility Cape benefit while wearing the ring, for example, it's not going to extend your stamina boost. I didn't know this until recently, so here you go. Apparently, if you click the Run Energy Orb next to the map at a specific interval, it will make your run energy last longer. It's pretty tedious, so I personally just cope through it, and I got this one from one of Soup's RuneScape Myth videos. Yoink. Last year, I told you there's an NPC at Narda that cleans all your herbs for you, and even makes unfinished potions after some tears of the Desert Diary. But there's another NPC that crushes all your items for you and saves a lot of time. Just like prayer, the Archaeus spellbook now has a new spell called the Grime. With it, you are able to clean herbs in your inventory, granted you have both the magic level required for them and the runes to cast the spell. Some herbs can even give you profit. For thieving, Jagex is planning to increase the number of coin pouches you can hold before having to open them all. People wanted them completely removed, which is not possible for now, but a nice incentive for you to do your diaries. At level 95 thieving and with a medium RD diary completed, you will be able to pickpocket RD knights with a 100% success rate. 
There's another friends chat you can find where people splash arty nights with no interruptions, which I've used before. Crafting is normally seen as an expensive skill to train, but by crafting jewelry and other gem items, you can even profit when training the skill. Just keep in mind that it's going to be pretty slow, but definitely a nice alternative to make some cash. We've talked about the Colossal Pouch and the Divine Rune Pouch before. And to make these, you will need 75 and 56 crafting respectively. Not only can you make jewelry with it, but also a ton of useful other untradeable items for your account. And now, two quick ones for fletching. This is a pretty simple one, but remember that the higher tier the logs you turn into arrow shafts, you will obtain more of them for a specific log. This is pretty useful if you're an ironman looking to make arrows. From two logs, you can also make wooden shields. You may use the base version for defensive stats, but you can combine some of them with dragon leather to make ranging shields. The stats are not great, but it's an okay alternative for an offhand item. When doing your birdhouse runs, you can pretty much use any type of seed to set them up. They have absolutely no effect on the loot since the tier of log is what decides how many nests you will get, but a nice use for commonly low-level seeds. As you know, there are hunter outfits in the game like Larupia, Horned Grahawk, and Sabertooth Kayat. Contrary to what they look like, they have absolutely zero effect on hunter, even on their respective creatures. This makes them only useful for Fashionscape. When you have the mining level required for it, by training at the mining guild, you can get unidentified minerals you can trade for three tiers of mining gloves. These have cool effects that are pretty niche, but it's nice to have for further training. If you go to the Motherload mine and start getting nuggets, the order of unlocks I recommend goes as follows. The bigger sack, upstairs area, full prospector, coal bag, gem bag, and then use any remaining nuggets on bags of gems for more profit. Once you have your ore, we will now move up to smithing. As you know, you have 50% chance of successfully smelting iron ore into bars at a furnace. If you use the spell Superheat, this will go up to 100% and you will also gain magic experience. If you don't want to use magic, there's an item called the Ring of Forging. By wearing it, it's going to use up a charge every time you smelt a piece of iron ore into an iron bar. It will eventually run out of charges, and you are going to need to wear more after it crumbles. There is a new training method by the name the Giant's Foundry. With it, you are able to recycle metal items made with two bars or more, and it's a very engaging activity, other than waiting for your character to smith an anvil or smelt gold. Also, for the Giant's Foundry, there are many ways to go about what to make your sword out of. For a general rule of thumb, you are better off making something called an alloy, which is made by adding 14 bars of two of the highest ones you can smelt. And finally, whenever you are working on your commission sword, you will make faster progress by pressing the tool you are currently working on when the interface has a yellow or a green outline around it. It's a great way to keep you active. When you're doing Temporos, take a Crystal Harpoon with you if you can. By doing so, you have a chance to catch Crystal Harpoon Fish, which will give you a ton more points, and it is a great item to take on your solo Temporos adventures. When you use up your permits at Temporos, you have a chance to get an item called Spirit Flakes. If you have them on you when fishing, they will give a 50% chance of catching an extra fish with no additional experience, and they are nice for some extra cash. If you decide to use them to upgrade your angler outfit instead, the Spirit Angler outfit will act as a rope. This means you are not going to need to have one in your inventory, and will be able to tether to poles when the waves are coming during a Temporos game. When it comes to cooking, you stop burning food at specific levels, and this is improved by wearing the cooking gloves and also by cooking at the host city's kitchen. So, make sure to check out the list and when you are gonna stop burning stuff. If you want cooking to go by incredibly fast, there's a training method called One Tick Karambwan. You need to be in a tile with a bank and a range next to each other, and use the rock around ones on the cooking spot every tick by holding number 2. As useless as fire making is, since all you do is burn logs and use up some light sources, thanks to Guardians of the Rift, this skill is actually somewhat useful now. Level it up in order to add different tier logs to your Abyssal Lantern for benefits inside the game. The only other thing I could come up with because this skill is just goddamn awful, is that by training with logs you can barely light, Try to do it as soon as possible after lighting one for a chance at consecutive lights. If you ever want to cut redwoods at the woodcutting guild, you might want to teleport with the skills necklace, right? Well, a much better option is to teleport to the current woodland with your Rada's Blessing, which doesn't use up any charges and it's a lot faster. If you want to train this skill slightly faster, teak trees are a great way to level up. After completion of Song of the Elves, you can cut teak trees north of Prifinus, and doing so will have a chance of giving you crystal shards for your trouble. And finally, a few for farming. First, as of the time of this upload, you need to equip the magic secators for them to have an effect when harvesting stuff. A future update is going to make it so it also works on the inventory, but 
why not just wear it? There are different compost bins scattered across the game. By using different types of crops on them, you will get either normal compost or super compost. You can see some of the items that yield each one on screen right now. There is a third type of compost called Ultra Compost. To get it, all you need to do is grab Super Compost Buckets and add an item called a Volcanic Ash. You can also add the ash to the compost bin before you take the compost out of it. And speaking of compost, last but not least we have the Bottomless Compost Bucket. By adding one of any type of compost to it, it will actually give you two charges, essentially cutting your compost needs in half for even more profit from herbs. The next 20 are for bosses since I didn't have any of these in the previous one. For the Abyssal Sire, the chance of stunning it goes up with the tier of smoke spell you use on it. From 25% thanks to the weakest spell, all the way up to 100% with smoke barrage. When you fight the alchemical hydra and it starts walking towards the center of the room for the firewall, you can avoid running like a degenerate by walking to this exact tile when it throws its head back to launch the attack, and you will completely skip the attack. The Hallowed Sepulchre drops an item called the Strange Lockpick. If you use it on any of the doors at the final tunnel when doing Barrow's Brothers, you can go through whatever door you want, making it a lot more convenient. You might know that you can use the Arc Light on servers since it's super effective because it counts as a demon. If you want to save on charges though, I find the Oswimtum's Fang works pretty great here since it's also a stabby boy. So, give it a try. When you go to the Dagonoth Kings, you might notice your prayer runs out pretty fast. This is because the monsters around the area can drain your prayer. And this will be completely negated if you have a Spectral Spirit Shield on you. If you start to crave some giant mole kills for the pets or general money making, do not even think about committing the grind long term without a Falador Hard Diary. With the shield, you will know where the mole is at all times. For the Grotus Guardians, if you are looking for faster kills or even the combat achievement speedrun tasks, you can cast the Vengeance spell and step under the final face of the boss on purpose to trigger the Vengeance and deal more damage. After your Hespori plant is fully grown, one of the best items to take there is a Crystal Halberd. Each special attack costs 30 special, and it's great since the fight consists of three main parts for even more damage and faster kills. With the addition of the Tombs of a Mascot, there's now a new best in slot item for the Caliphate Queen called the Keras Partisan of Breaching, also known as the Blue Keras. It has increased accuracy and damage against Calphites and Scarabs. Thanks to a not-so-recent update, you can now take the Fishing Explosive to your Kraken tasks. Use the Potion on the Whirlpool in the middle of the room, and wait for the Kraken to attack you for you to attack back. Two clicks is all you need per kill. If you go to the Nightmare of Ashihama in the group, it will focus on the person with the highest defense in the group so everyone else can chill. I recently learned this when I was doing my combat achievements for the Nightmare, so now you know too. When you gather pieces of the Dark Totem at the Catacombs of Corinth to fight Scutizo, it has a 100% chance to drop a hard clue and 20% chance to drop an elite clue. If you are hunting for masters, it is a great place to start hunting for lower tier scrolls. As you are fighting the corrupted Hunlif, try to avoid getting him to attack in the corner of his room. Otherwise, you won't have all that space to maneuver around. You can lower it by standing on the opposite corner yourself and continue the fight. The Thermonuclear Smoke Devil is a level 93 Slayer Smoke Devil variant you can kill with different methods. A great one is by using Redemption. Walk under it and the trade blows with the Redemption active until it procs for you to heal up with prayer. The Tombs of a Mascot is now my favorite PVM content in the game, so why not give you a few for it? When fighting Baba and after the Boulder attack, it will focus on the person with the lowest HP in the room, and then it's going to swap randomly. When you down Kefri for the second time, the Arcane Scarab, also known as a Mage, will spawn in a corner. When you hit it for 40 or above, it will automatically go to another place in the room, so if you see a big number, start running towards it. If doing Akka in a group, people can stand on each other during the detonation attack which paints players white. This is especially useful at higher invocation rates where it detonates much faster so you don't need to find safe spots. Also during groups, when fighting against Zebak with the blood spell invocation active, make sure to stay the hell away from each other. Otherwise the spell will work just like it does for us and will hit for massive numbers in a clump. During the obelisk phase of the Wardens, the very edges of the room are all safe spots and you can run there for safety in case you mess up the timing for blocking the orbs. With a weapon with long enough range, you can also attack from here. Finally, a quick one for Jad. If the healers get him up all the way back to full HP and you take long enough to kill it, there's a chance the healers will spawn again if you kill them. So, make sure to either finish them fast or lure them behind Jad. To finish off the list, I have 10 random tips for you. For the first one, there's an item called the Bolt Pouch you can get at Keldegrim. 
It holds four types of bolts, and it's a great item to have by doing activities that requires many of them, just like the Phantom Muspa. If you have a Dragonfire Shield, a Dragonfire Ward, or an Ancient Wyvern Shield, instead of going near dragons to absorb their fire, you can buy an item on the GE called Bottled Dragonfire. It's pretty cheap, so use it on your shields for a quick charge. If you have completed Song of the Elves and your Scald, you can go inside the gauntlet and come out right away to remove the skull automatically. You can also do this at Clan Wars if you don't have access to Prifinus. There's an item called the Clue Box, and if you have a Clue Scroll or a Casket in the Wilderness, where you would typically lose it by death, instead of losing it, the Clue Box will disappear to protect your scroll or your chest. Certain places in the game, especially some skilling guilds, will offer an invisible boost to your skills for faster gathering like woodcutting, fishing, or mining. However, as it's obvious, it's not going to let you do stuff you don't have the level for. If you die, there are different spawns in the game with different ways to activate or change them. You are seeing them on screen right now, and they all have their niche uses. I have the Lumbridge one, but may have to change to Edgeville soon. A profitable training method for both prayer and fire making is by cremating Shade Remains at Berg the Rot after Shades of Morton. The keys you get from it can also be used for extra loot, but keep in mind that this is extremely boring. By talking to any banker in the game, you are now able to buy more bank space. You can buy a few extra spaces for a few million GP, and the highest one is gonna cost almost a billion gold. So, save up or keep your bank nice and clean. An underrated and overlooked transportation method is the Gnome Glider. With the Royal Seed Pod from Monkey Madness 2, you can go to the top of the Grand Tree and use a few cool teleports to different parts of the map. There's a shortcut in the Brimstone Dungeon that takes you near the Dragons, but you'll have to pay a small fee to unlock it. I also recently learned this, and it was such a huge help when doing some Slayer tasks you can't get away from. Last and definitely not least, just like I said in the previous video, one of my biggest tips is just to have a ton of fun. This game is super chill and you can play at your own pace, so don't stress out about levels unless you are strictly competing with someone. Oh, ladies and gentlemen in the chat, thank you so much for watching and making it this far. If you did, make sure to leave your number one tip for Old School RuneScape. Include the word banana in your comments and you will be entered in a bond giveaway where we will pick a comment at random on Friday. It doesn't matter if it's a tip you saw here, but the more information the better. I want to give a massive thank you to all the boys and girls who have become channel members. Your support goes a long way, and you have no idea how much I appreciate you for it. If you want to support this channel further, click the join button below to see all the benefits you can get for doing so. In the next one, we will go over the farming skill and show you how to achieve level 99 in the fastest or the most profitable way possible. Have an amazing day, have an amazing week, and I will see you then. Ba-ba-ba-ba, a peace.